Well, good evening, everybody. And so good to be with you again tonight. Uh, really excited about our, our message uh, on the book of Ephesians. And uh, I'm sure that if you've been following, you know that we are following Ephesians every single uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. So just if you can join me, that'll be great. Otherwise, you can watch it a little bit later. So um, welcome. And uh, really good to be in the Word tonight. I just uh, felt we needed to pray as we start. So let's pray together. Lord, just thank you that as we come together tonight in this way, that we can join together in your Word. We can listen to what you have to say to us, especially in this time. And Lord, the book of Ephesians was written to many churches at, this, at, at the time of Paul. And it's a prison letter, Lord, but it's a letter that's just so full of encouragement, so full of wisdom and guidance for that generation and also for this generation. So just bless us as we enjoy this time together. And thank you for those that are joining in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So welcome, Sharon, Linda, and uh, Ed, I see you as well. It's lovely to be tonight. And others that have joined, uh, welcome to you. I'm just going to um, go back a little bit and just remind you of the fact that we did um, the book of Ephesians from chapter 1, from verses 1 to 14. And uh, we know that this book was a prison letter written in around about 62 AD and obviously written by Paul uh, and written to not only the church in Ephesus, but they would have taken this letter possibly and redirected it to other churches in the region. And Ephesus was a well-known region, so it was well kind of centered for them so that they could get the message around. There are three main themes in Ephesians. The first is that Christ has reconciled all creation to himself and to God. Isn't that lovely? The second theme is, and this is so important for now, hey, when we think about you know, what's going on in terms of uh, you know, gender-based violence and you know, the, the, the challenges around reconciliation. And you know, that the second point of Ephesians is that Christ has united people from all nations to himself and to one another. Isn't that lovely? So, you know, we have no excuse to be reconciled to each other. And then the third part of Ephesians is really about how to live as new people belonging to Christ. It talks about the church, talks about family, talks about children, and how we need to be living together. So that's kind of an over, overview of, the, of Ephesians. The main purpose of Ephesians is, is, is that it's a general instruction uh, in the truths of God's redemptive work in Christ. Uh, it talks about, you know, the importance of unity, all the time the importance of unity, and amongst the diverse people, you know. I often think about South Africa and how diverse we are. Isn't that beautiful? So colorful. And uh, this book really speaks about how to work together, how to be together in a diverse and situation with a diverse people group. And then also just how to conduct ourselves as a church. And also in the world, how we conduct ourselves. It's so critical. And so as we go into um, tonight, I just want to remind you that the first part of the letter is Paul writing as an apostle. And I said to you last week, I love the fact that he doesn't call himself Apostle Paul. He says, Paul, an apostle. And uh, in a humble way, you know, one who is sent to share the good news. That's what an apostle actually is. Speaking to the faithful of, of Ephesus, but obviously many others. And then just, uh, you know, starting out with such praise and blessing to these people, but also enabling them to understand that they were chosen for a cause. And we talked about predestination last week, and not that one, is, one group is predestined and another isn't, but that we are all in Christ predestined to do great things for God. So that's what predestination is more about than, you know, one or the other. And I spoke about that last week. And then that we have the rights isn't this a beautiful thing, you know, that God gives us the rights of a firstborn son, both men and women. So it doesn't matter whether you're a male or a female, you have the rights, you know, of, of Jesus. I mean, who is, uh, is really the firstborn son, but we have rights. And so I love the Methodist Church that we really see and we honor the fact that all who are called to be ministers of the gospel, whether male or female, it doesn't matter. We're called into this oneness. And we have rights. <laughs> it's beautiful, eh? And then we only, not only that, but we call into the mystery. And I spoke last week about moving out of the questions into the mystery. 
And then last but not least, just, um, you know, Paul saying, you know, that all that he was doing was to the praise and glory of God. And uh, I was reminded of this in this week, you know, that we do everything to the pra praise and glory of Almighty God. And so we're going to get into this beautiful prayer that uh, Paul prays for the people of Ephesus and obviously for the other community. And I wanted to read it, I want to read it to you and then we're going to unpack it tonight. So it says, for this reason, ever since I heard, and it's from verse 15, by the way, that's where we are tonight. Welcome, Margaret and Mumsy. <laughs> Lovely to be with you tonight. Eh? And others that are joining us, welcome. So for this reason, from verse 15, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking. This is a beautiful prayer. Even to pray over somebody that you love dearly. Eh? I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And then listen to this. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet <laughs> and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Isn't that lovely? This is the word of the Lord. Eh? Thanks be to God tonight. So let's get in there. Let's get stuck in and we're going to go deeper with this scripture. I always say, you know, that where there's a word for this reason, you've got to actually ask, for what reason? You know, why is there the words for this reason? And obviously, Paul is, uh, you know, is, is bringing an introduction into the letter of the fact that they are chosen, that they're called, that they've been set apart, that they've been given, been given rights. And for this reason, he prays for them. Isn't that wonderful? So he prays for them out of that context. Now, also remembering that, Within the context that they were in, the, the folk in Ephesus were surrounded by this, this, um, this worship of a goddess called Artemis. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about the port city of Ephesus. It was located on what is now the western coast of, coast of Tur Turkey. It was the crown jewel of Asia Minor. It had a, had a population of about 250,000 people. That's kind of half the population of George and was home to more than 20 pagan temples. Can you imagine that? It, it had artistic beauty. It had cultural learning, but it also had this erotic pagan worship that went on in the city. And uh, people would be drawn to this place to worship this goddess called Artemis. And so they, they created this enormous uh, temple dedicated to, to Artemis, which was 450 feet long and 220 feet wide. I mean, that's enormous, you know. And it had more than 120 columns in it, 60 feet high, and was, was called one of the seven wonders of the entire world at that time. And so because Artemis was con considered to be so powerful and protective of her temple, people all over the world came and they deposited money there. I mean, can you just imagine this? And so it was quite wealthy. That city was quite wealthy because of this, this uh, goddess that they worshipped there. And so the Ephesians and Ephesus was, was, a, was a very wealthy city and made wealthy because of this goddess. And they protected it. They protected her and they protected the goddess because their wealth came from it. I mean, part of their revenue came from it. And so when Paul speaks to the people of Ephesus, and just think about that, eh? that he went into the city in spite of all that was going on around them. And he chose the city to bring the gospel in spite of Artemis and all the things that were going on. 
And he said, for this reason, because you are chosen and you're called. And in spite of Artemis, you are serving me and you are loving me. You're loving the Lord, not loving Paul. But because you are loving the Lord, uh, I'm going to make sure that you understand that I love you, you know. And uh, for this reason, I'm praying for you because I know of the challenges that surround you in this particular context. And so, you know, that's the first point is that we need to see that where there is a word for this reason, we need to understand what it's there for. And so that pretty much unpacks it for you. And then he goes on and he says, I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. Isn't that wonderful? Eh? So, you know, in spite of the situation that they're in, and think about the situation that you're in right now. You know, one says, one, one, one is called by God to keep the faith. You know, I spoke about that last week. Keep the faith. You know, don't give up. Keep the faith. And so he says, you know, I, I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus. And then a lovely next part says, and your love for all God's people. Now remember, it's Jews and Gentiles. You know, there are all sorts of different people that have come to faith. But others that are in the city as well, you know. And uh, I love to think that everyone is God's people, you know. Maybe some have not recognized that. Some have not connected with it. But, uh, you know, we are, 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 are created in the likeness of, of God, you know, male and female, black and white, whatever culture or community. And we need to have a love for all God's people. Isn't that beautiful? So, you know, so we have no excuse. And Paul had recognized this in the people of Ephesus, you know, in spite of the challenges, they had a love for all God's people. And I think this would solve a multitude of challenges in our world right now, you know. When we think about what's going on, you know, we need to just say, I love you, man. Whoever's online now, Mumsy, love to see you. And I love you as a sister in the faith, you know, and a wonderful preacher of the gospel. Welcome, Val. I can see that you're on as well and watching and others. So I mustn't get distracted. We must keep focused on the word, hey? So just moving on, he goes on to say, you know, that he, he um, hears about their faith in the Lord and their love for God's people. And then he says, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Let me tell you, friends, you know, um, Paul talks about a continuous uh, prayer. You know, and I know, you know, our brains and our minds, they go all over the place. And we find ourselves not focusing properly. And I mean, I'm as much as guilty as you are of that. But there is a sense that we keep in our hearts and our minds a sense of giving thanks for people, remembering people in our prayers. And you know, um, I remember Michael Cassidy. And Michael Cassidy, if you're watching, uh, oh, you're a wonderful mentor. But I remember Michael saying, you know, just keep a list of those that you pray for. And uh, I have a journal that I keep every single day. And in my journal, I have people that I pray for. And I trust that you do the same, you know. But there's kind of a main list. And then there's another list, you know, of other people that I pray for. And then the church people that I pray for and whoever else. And, you know, it's that ability to not stop giving thanks for them, remembering them in my prayers. I run up Erica Road, Val, and uh, come past your house and your beautiful dogs greet me, you know, and I pray for you. And others in the city. And, you know, I think about different people around all the time. But, uh, you know, giving thanks for them is such a wonderful way to pray and remembering them in our prayers. And then it goes on in verse 17. It says, I keep asking that the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Now, this is a very important friends, you know. Uh, I often think about Solomon. And Solomon, you know, when the Lord said, I want to give you a gift, Solomon said, well, Lord, I want the gift of wisdom. <laughs> and so, you know, when, when Paul was praying for these people, he prayed that they would have not only wisdom, but also revelation. But in this day and age, friends, I don't know about a more important time than this, to have wisdom and discernment, especially with what's going on in our world with this COVID-19 thing. You know, wisdom means that we listen to what doctors say. Wisdom means that we wear a mask to protect others. Wisdom means that we, <laughs> we keep understanding and knowing that God is in control, you know, and that he ultimately will bring us through this. That's wisdom. 
You know, not to be fearful. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. Think about that. And so, friends, you know, when Paul prays for the people of Ephesus and the other surrounding churches, he prays that they would have wisdom. But not only wisdom, he talks also about revelation. And uh, revelation is an interesting thing. Eh? It's so, so often misconstrued. Sometimes we think of the book of Revelation, which is very powerful. And I always say it's God's last love letter to the churches, <laughs> the seven churches. But when we think about revelation, we need to understand that revelation comes from God. And so, you know, when we think about revelation coming from God, we remember also, and we spoke about that last week, that the Spirit leads us into all truth. Remember, you know, that Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll give you another, a comforter, a counselor, one who is the same. And he will lead you into all truth. And so revelation really is about being aware and conscious of the truth. And I always say that the truth sets you free. Isn't that beautiful, eh? You know, so when you're feeling, you know, you're moving into a thing and you think, oh, this is not feeling right. You know, then you're not being led into truth. I don't know about you, but every now and then I go past the channels in, on the TV and man, I feel like a TV evangelist now when we're doing this stuff. But there are some that are speaking and I think, oh, I don't think that that can be revelation from God. I need to be discerning, of course, bless their souls. But at the same time, I need to discern as to whether it's revelation from the scriptures and from the Lord and the Spirit leading me into all truth or something else. We need to be very very careful friends and so you know Paul prays and he says Lord give them give them your spirit the spirit of wisdom and revelation and then this part so that you may know the Lord better <laughs> isn't that beautiful you know so you know I want to know the Lord better in this time and I must say you know during this COVID time I've just been so grateful that I've been able to know the Lord better and I trust the same for you and then there's this beautiful part that goes on. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, I pray that the eyes of your heart, verse 18, may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, have you ever wondered, friends, and I don't know whether I am the only one that wonders about these things, but where the eyes of your, of your heart are. I nearly said where the eyes of your heart are. <laughs> where the eyes of your heart are. And uh, we're in Bible study, so we can have a little bit of fun. Eh? But obviously your heart doesn't have any eyes. I mean, we know that. But it's interesting that there is, um, there is this inner person that we all know about. <laughs> Isn't that true? Eh? Uh, you know, it's, it's that person, it's Pete, that you don't know too much about, but then I know about quite a lot. Debbie knows about this Pete. My boys know about this Pete. My dad knows about this Pete. And there's some very close friends that knows, know about this Pete. Uh, but the Lord knows me, this inner person. And in this inner person, there is, and we often talk about this, we talk about you know, having a heart after God's own heart. I mean, we, we know that from Scripture. But this inner heart, this sense of heart that knows about God's blessing and it kind of has eyes. Does that make sense? And so, you know, we, uh, we sing that song. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. What are we singing, eh? I want to see you, see you, and it goes on. But, you know, there is a real sense that the, the heart, the heart, when it's connected to God's heart, starts to see things. And that's really powerful. There is a, a, re, a, a theologian called Pascal, and he says the heart has its reasons, which reason does not know. We feel it in a thousand things. There is a spiritual seeing through and beyond natural seeing. There is a spiritual hearing through and beyond natural hearing. There is a spiritual discerning through and beyond natural reasoning. And so when we talk about the eyes of the heart, friends, we talk about the fact that the Holy Spirit 
has given us an ability to see things beyond ourselves, an ability to, to see through and beyond the natural, to, see and be, to hear and, uh, through and beyond the natural, and that there is a spiritual discerning that God gives to us, and that we know that we know that we know. It doesn't just come from the eyes, but it comes from the heart. And so how we conceive things, friends, and how we understand the glory of God, especially as Christians. Andrew, it's good to see you, man. But how we understand this, friends, is in the sense that we have completely submitted and surrendered to God. And we are not only seeing eye through our eyes physically, but we are seeing through our eyes spiritually. And, you know, Paul makes it quite clear in Romans chapter 1, verses 21. He says this, he says, Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. And that's interesting and astonishing because, you know, he kind of says, well, everyone knows God in a certain way. They might not admit to it. They might uh, speak about it in a negative kind of way. But he says here that they don't honor Him because there's not, going, not anything going on inside of their their heart and the eyes of their heart. And so, you know, it's it's what God gives us. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says, In the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. And then he goes on, he says, Yet you do know God. Galatians 4, verse 8, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, 1 John 4, verse 8, eh? You know God. How do we know God? <laughs> And uh, we need to know that there is a revelation hey, of truth that has come into our hearts. And it open up, opens up a, an understanding of God, a revelation of God that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't ever underestimate that, friends. All right. And then as we go on in the scripture, we've got a few, mo a few more minutes. Uh, it goes on to, to say, you know, that he opens our hearts and he calls us uh, to understand this in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And so the reason why he gives us these eyes of the heart to see these things is so that we will understand and know three things. And these three, three things come out in the scripture. He says that we will have a, an understanding of the hope to which he has called you. Isn't that beautiful, eh? You know, that hope that does not disappoint us. I love that about God. I love that about Jesus. It's a hope that does not disappoint us. Don't you love that? And so we will have uh, an understanding of the hope to which, is being, to which you have been called, to which I have been called. Secondly, we will have an understanding of the riches of his glorious inheritance. And so, you know, it doesn't matter what you win or lose on earth. <laughs> You know, that's not important how much or little you have. It's not important in the equation of God. What is important, friends, is understanding the glorious inheritance that we have not only in the eternal realms, but also here on earth to make a difference. And that inheritance, you know, is not so that we will sit back and have some fancy riches. No, but it's so that we can be the hands and feet of Almighty God. The inheritance that we have, eh? is one that draws us into a place where we are wanting to reconcile, where we're wanting to help feed the poor, where we're wanting to work against gender-based violence, where we want to, we were wanting to work against injustices in our world. You know, that is our inheritance. Don't you love that? You know, it's an inheritance that not only is for eternity, and yes it is, but for also for here on earth, so that we'll be active and involved in changing and transforming the way that the world is. And the church has been given that responsibility. And mostly, as Paul says in Corinthians, the ministry of reconciliation, friends. And Paul brings us out to the Ephesians. And remember, he's praying all this time for them. Eh? Isn't that beautiful? And the third thing is that incomparable great power that we have, those that believe in Christ. It's the same power, says Paul, that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 20, it says, He exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So, you know, just think about that strength, that power, that authority that comes from God, not from us. <laughs> it's a power that comes from him. Eh? 
And people have abused that power. They've exerted their own power, not God's power. And we need to be careful, friends, so careful that we understand this correctly because it comes from God and it's exerted upon us. It's given to us, but as, as a gift from God, not to be abused. And so often I've seen, and you've seen as well, I'm sure, how the church has abused power. And even in our day and age, we're going to be talking on Sunday about the church. And, you know, I'm starting to think, what is the church looking like? What is, what is it going to look like as we go through into the next session of this time, you know? And I think it's going to be different. More power from above. <laughs> more humility, you know? More graciousness. Maybe smaller church. Who knows? But none of this big power thing, you know, of the big apostle or the big bishop or the big reverend. No, it's Pete cheering, you know, saying, I have, I have pieces of bread and I'm just sharing it with you, man. I'm one bigger, showing other beggars where there is food tonight. So bless you. And let me move on before I get distracted. And so it says that we have that power and that power is not to be abused. And it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, verse 20. And then verse 21 says, it says, um, let me just go back again. He exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realm. So Jesus is forever seated in authority and power at the right hand of the Father. Don't ever underestimate that, you know, that the Jesus that we serve is, has all authority and all power over all things, over corona, COVID-19, coronavirus, over the things that are going on in your world. He has power and authority over everything. Amen and hallelujah. Let's see some hearts and, and, and things go up as we say amen and hallelujah. You can do that by pushing your little button on the side. Eh? And so he rules in authority and he's at the right hand of the Father. I love that. The right hand of the Father. And it goes on, it says, Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present, present age, but also in the, in the one to come. And so think about, again, about Ephesus and Artemis and all these goddesses and goddesses. And he says, you know, Artemis might have some power in the city of Ephesus, but, but Jesus is, is way above that power, you know. Not only the powers of the present age, but also the future as well. You know, and where powers come up and people start to raise, you know, themselves as some great power, you want to say, no, 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 that's not what the point is of the scripture. The point of the scripture is that Jesus has authority and he is over all those powers. And so where there is submissiveness, friends, it's a wonderful thing to see. I'm not too sure about the um, president of Malawi and uh, there's a new president. Seems like a wonderful guy and I don't want to get into politics right now. But it seemed like he was really wanting to submit to God and put in a new, um, you know, put people into a new place. And, you know, we need to pray for our own country that they're constantly thinking, you know, that we are, they as the rulers of this country are submitted under the power and authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And not in a, in a way that, you know, puts one in another in different places, but enables the gospel to be strong. Amen. Please, Lord, let us be strong. Not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And then, and so, you know, this, this, this dominion, this power, we need to understand, goes from one generation to the next. And then, I love this last little bit, and we're just about there. It says, And God placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Isn't that lovely? And so just, you know, to understand this, you know, when, when, when things are put under the, under the feet of Jesus, you know, uh, Psalm 8, 8 verse 7 speaks about that, you know, that everything is, is under him, the footstool. And, uh, and Jesus is over and above everything. Everything is under his authority. And feet always talk about authority, friends. And then it goes on, it says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, by the way, 1 Corinthians 15, 27 speaks about this as well. And then he speaks about the fact that he is head over the church. And, you know, in this time, in this season, friends, I would love to see the church being reconciled, coming together again. So important, eh? Not one church above the other, not one denomination above the other. 
you know, not one big guy above the other, but just one church where we see Jesus Christ as the head. I share a little story, but it's uh, one that I've shared before, where somebody came into our church a while back and they said, you know, we want to see the person who's in control of this church. Who's the head of this church? Uh, we want to speak to him. And uh, I was listening very carefully because they were talking to me. And I said, well, he's here. <laughs> and they said, but no, we need to talk to him right now. I said, well, you can talk to him. He's right here. He says, who is the, and then they said, who is the head of this church? And I said, Jesus is the head of this church. <laughs> Not me, but Jesus. Yeah. So, you know, friends, please, Lord, let Jesus be the head of the church, man. In this day, in this season, in this hour, so many are rising up to try and be the head. Jesus is the head of the church. And he makes this point. And, you know, he says, everything is under my feet, man. And he is the head of everything for the church. And then remember this, we are his body, you know. This, this gives us such authority, but also it implicates us for great things. When we are called to be his body, then we need to say, Lord, you are my head. And, you know, as we move forward in this time, in the season, it means that as his body, you've got to think all the time. You know, what is the head going to be saying? What is he going to be telling us to do, you know? And uh, in this time, I just feel like he, he's saying, love more, care more, be more. Uh, like me in every possible way. I listened to my wonderful friend Dion Foster today and uh, speaking to Roger and uh, you know he just summarized um, four things and I just want to end with that as we conclude tonight but four things that we need to be doing as a church as we enable him to fill us and it speaks about the fact that he fills us with everything in every way and so to be filled with everything in every every way Make sure, friends, that we do these four things, that we witness to the truth, the truth that sets people free. That's where we started and that's where we'll end. Secondly, we need to bind up the brokenhearted. Eh? In our day and in our age, let's be the church, you know, that goes out there. It doesn't matter who it is, who they are, who they are, where they come from. Let's bind up the brokenhearted. Thirdly, we need to live the alternative, you know, where the world is saying do this and where maybe even the church is saying do that. We need to live the alternative of Jesus Christ. What is he saying as the head of the church? And last but not least, and thank you Dion Foster for this, we need to replace evil with good. And so as we close tonight, I pray this prayer over you, friends. Go back and read from verse 15 to 23. Pray it over your family. Pray it over your friends. Let them just know that they are deeply loved by you and it's a wonderful, you know, if you're ever looking for a scripture to uh, share with somebody else, it's a wonderful scripture to share. And so, uh, Ravi, Stephen, Arch, and others that have joined tonight, bless you. And let's just close in a word of prayer, as I promise I'll be finished in just over half an hour. So let's pray together as we close. Lord, thank you for your beautiful book of Ephesians, the living word. Thank you for Paul that wrote this to the people of Ephesus. In a difficult situation, Lord, where they were consumed and confronted by this goddess Artemis uh, that completely consumed Ephesus. And uh, you shared with them and showed them your heart for them. And you shared your love for them, Lord, through Paul's beautiful prayer. Giving thanks for them, remembering them, asking that they would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And may we have that tonight, Lord, a spirit of wisdom and revelation in this time, so that we may know you better. Pray, Lord, for the eyes of our hearts to be opened. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to know you better and better each day. And may you give us, Lord, the, the ability to have discernment and understanding of what that means, so that our eyes will be able to see you, and that we'll be aware, Lord, of what we've been called to. Called, Lord, to, to bring hope, called to bring an understanding of the riches of your glory, called to be a holy people, called to be people of power, <laughs> not our own power, but yours. And Lord, that we would know that that same power that raised you from the, get, from the dead is in us, not so that we would look great, but so that you would look great. And so Lord, bless us as we continue in this time. Help us to be aware of who we are as the church. Forgive us, Lord, for becoming haughty or separated in any possible way. 
May we find ourselves, Lord, every single day saying, Lord, you first, me second. Help me to become less and you to be, you become more. Help me to find you, Lord, in this night. And as those that have joined tonight, Lord, are with me, I pray your blessing again as I pray always just the Lord's blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May you, the Lord give you peace, a peace that passes all understanding as you spend time with him in the quietness of the night. And Proverbs 3 verse 24 says, May the Lord give you sweet sleep tonight. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for being with me. Eh? And next week we, we tackle chapter 2, which is entitled, Made Alive in Christ. Eh? Let's be alive. So uh, bless you. And this Sunday I'm going to be, be looking at the church. And uh, really, what is the future of the church? Uh, what is the future of the church? That's going to be the question for Sunday. So join us at half past nine. But thanks for being with me tonight, all 25 of you and more. And uh, bless you, Delphine and Ellen and Jane, Sharon, Sari, and all the rest of you that have been watching. I uh, love you lots. Ange, bless you. And amen and amen. Good night and God bless.